Welcome to Real Money Talks, how to make money, manage money, and invest money. Your Real Money Talks host, Laurel Langmire, gets straight to the point about what it actually takes to make money and build lasting wealth in today's changing economic climate. If you're ready to get the financial results you've always dreamed of, keep listening. Real Money Talks is the right place for you. And now here's your host, Laurel Langmire. Hi, this is Laurel, and welcome back to Laurel's Real Money Talks podcast. Uh, every day, we are podcasting around the world, and we're talking about quality conversations around money and investing, specifically the millionaire system that I created. Um, and really, I didn't create it. It's been created for centuries. How do you become a millionaire? It is you make money, you keep money, you invest money, and you do it with a team. So I uh, bring teammates to this podcast that I think have a lot of insight and brilliance for you and uh, to share that. At any time during the podcast, if you have questions, go to asklaurel.com, give us your name, phone number, and email, and then just say, head like appointment or more conversations with my guest and uh, we'll keep going. Today we're gonna talk about real estate, specifically about the interest rates, uh, how to buy cash versus leverage, and using private money. So those are our three topics. Um, I have my partner, Jesse Brewer, and we're in the Kentucky market. That's right. <laughs> and uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. In fact, we're gonna be going to Cincinnati July 27, eight and nine, and we're gonna be doing a tour, walking people through how Jesse does a multi-million dollar enterprise in Ohio. So welcome. Hello. Tell us a little bit about you and your background. How did you get into this? Like I've watched you take a few rounds through this real estate world, so you can maybe give some background. On... I'm like an old war bird. If you I are. talk to people that have been around for a while, I don't feel like it. I've, it definitely has aged me. I've been through a lot of the ups and downs of the market. Uh, I grew up in real estate somewhat. Uh, Dad owned some rental property, but he was a very traditional type investor, just mm -hmm. hands on, pay cash for it. If you can't afford it, don't buy it kind of guy. And had a couple small bank loans here and there, but no, he was always a subscriber, which a lot of people were. Yep. Because interest rates, you know, back in the 80s were what, what stupid were they? high. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. Double them. digits, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I was born in 78, so I really, you know, didn't, I wasn't privy to all that, but I knew it was really high. So if you couldn't pay cash for it, he, he didn't want to buy it because it, it could, you couldn't afford a bank loan on a yep. property back yep. then. Uh, at least that's what he always told me. Yeah. So um, started buying rental property. I was 22 years old. Um, market was really good. You know, the interest bank loans were easy to give. You know, back when they were doing all uh -huh. the non-interoccupied, ninja yep. loans, this and that and the other. So got a few of those uh, high interest, easy obtain loans myself when I was first starting out. And uh, saw the crash and had to figure things out quick and came out better from the crash in the long run. Mm -hmm. Here I am. And so uh, let's talk about interest rates. It's like a big thing ever since Trump's been elected. And uh, a lot of people have, you know, all sorts of concerns that Trump's going to change things. And the one thing I always say, you know, about Trump is my funny new conversation because I've traveled with him and I know him is, you know, get past his personality and his hair. And he's one of us, <laughs> right? He's I saw, a pure I saw a hashtag the other day talking about the stock market interest rates. It said it's the Trump bump economy. It's the new hashtag with Trump bump. Oh, that's funny. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm hashtagging, I'm, I'm stealing the Trump bump. I like that. <laughs> no. Well, because he's one of us. I mean, he's a pure blooded entrepreneur. He's a wealth builder. He owns tons of real estate. He's not going to do anything to harm us on this side. Now, the people who should be worried are the people who should be worried, which, you know, have done nothing but live on socialization and welfare and sit on their ass and do nothing. And, you know, Good. <laughs> right. That's not our conversation. So I actually uh, know that uh, from, you know, even Jesse, I said on one of my last podcasts, you know, we're 73,000 pages of tax code. I think by the time Trump's done with this, it, whether he's reelected or not, I think we'll be nearing 100,000. I mean, the incentives he's going to give and giving already to corporations and to entrepreneurs and hiring incentives and land lease incentives, they're everywhere. I mean, so it's already started. So interest rates is one of the conversations. So let's get back to ours, which is a lot of people are freaking out that it's going to go up. And it, it already has a little. So it's share bumped with us up a little bit. On. So I looked at, uh, I like to use bank rate. Yeah. It's a plug for bank rate. It's just, that's just a site I go mm -hmm. to. And so I looked at a 30-year fix today at bank rate. The, the, today, the bank rate fix was 4.1 on a 30-year traditional mortgage. 
<laughs> then I went back. There's another website I use. I forget the name of it. It's in my bookmarks. And you can do like a 10-year projection, whatever interest rates 10 years ago, this uh -huh. day kind of thing. And, and now this was 2017, so it was uh, still the kind of the top of the market. It hasn't really started to crash yet. It was still kind of hot. Mm -hmm. There were 6.1% and people were buying up real estate like crazy right. and no one was batting an eye about it. You know, we're, we're two points lower right. today right. than we were 10 years ago, but people want to say, oh, interest rates are going up. Let's run for the hills. Uh, <laughs> and, and usually a commercial rate's about a point higher, yep. you know, percent, yep. a point to percent. If you ever, if I ever right. use the term point, I just, I get yep. a funny no, good. looks. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, back then, you know, 2007, a commercial rate was seven. You yeah. know, today, a commercial rate's a little over five. I got a loan out right now. I just get ready to close on a five and a quarter, mm -hmm. five, uh, on a five-year, 25-year amortization loan, which is a, a, a dig on good rate for a commercial yeah. loan for not owner occupied just rental um, property. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, the rates aren't going to go stupid high, and I don't think they can. Uh, you know, so we'll talk about that because I know sure. you have some. I know you don't like to get into politics and stuff. Uh, not to be political like, about it, but I mean, but let's the be fact political. is, we, 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 we owe trillions of dollars 20 trillion. 20 trillion. 20 trillion. And if we raise the interest rates, we've got to raise the money we've got to pay back on our own debt. Yeah. And I don't know the bipartisan issue or not. If you, who wants to pay more money for anything, right. you right. know? The Democrats, the Republicans, nobody wants to pay more money for yeah. anything. It doesn't make sense for anybody. So if they raise the rate, plus it'll crush the economy. I mean, if they raise them 9, 10, 15%, like the, the doomsdayers say they're going yeah. to, it would crush any kind of... Real estate would be done. Real estate would be done. They wouldn't, because don't you think also, Jesse, we've had such, I mean, what, a decade trend of under fives, right? I mean... People don't even know how to buy an eight, ten, or twelve environment. No, I mean, they don't. They, our they're parents do. Our parents do. Absolutely. But we do. don't know how to buy, and that it would just be paralysis to the market, wouldn't it? It, so, would, it would. It would. It would. It would. It would be a definitely a opposite trend type situation. Yeah. And no, the the few that know how to buy would get really, 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 really rich from it. But the average day, it, it would crush the average day buyer. It would crush it. And, and, and then we're already having enough problems as it is selling real estate property with, you know, the millennial generation, which is a different topic we're going to... Come on, coming up next. Coming yeah, up, we're a different go. topic down yeah. the line. But raising of the interest rates is, would be detrimental to the, not only to our national debt and paying that back, but just to our overall housing market. And, and as we all learned in 2007 and 8 and 9... You know, the housing market crash wiped out every facet of the economy, not, you know, not a lot of them. So it, so they definitely are yeah. going to be kind to that baby and yeah. take care of it. Yep. And so um, they're starting to bump a little. Do you see, like, do you give any prediction to a top out? Like it's going to right? give what I don't think, think a 30-year fix will go above five anytime in the near future. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, it's at 4-1 now, I think, before Trump. Got, and they always go up on election cycles. Yep. And, they, and it's just a, I think it's just an excuse. It's a bullshit excuse to do it. Yeah, yeah. But they can. Well, so, and it's so a blame excuse. And, especially this, this whole group, right? They right. don't pick on him anymore. It's a blame excuse <laughs> and they do it. But I think it went up from, what, a 3, what was it, a 3-5, three, 3-6, three, three, yep. three, maybe, to a 4-1 today. If it gets up to a five by midterms, yep. and what's that in two years, year and a half, they'll start the midterm cycle. I'd be shocked. Yeah. But you never know. But I mean, I, I, I given it that projection rate, so if it goes a five, so what? I mean, the, in the grand scheme of things, it's not real. It's still very, very cheap money when you start looking at historic rates. Yep. Yep. And um, let's move to our second topic. So the next one I want to talk about is cash versus leverage, you know. Uh, you know, a leverage purchase. So if you're going to buy, so first describe, because some of our listeners are more, you know, I don't, there's a whole variety out there. So uh, a cash versus purchase, per, yeah, a cash versus a leverage purchase, describe that first. Well, a cash purchase, just, you know, you straight up cash, you're, you're, if you got money sitting in a bank and you're not doing anything with it, what do you call that, a, a lazy asset? It's a lazy right? asset. If you have a lazy yeah. asset, earn, not doing anything, uh, earning what your 0.5% at the mm -hmm. bank or whatever it is, and you want to go buy a piece of rental property with it, well, you're using all of your own money. Yep. Which, you know, I know you're not a big, not a big fan of that, and I'm not a huge fan of it. I mean, I've done it a few times to be yep. competitive on deals, so I'm not a huge fan of it. But, you know, your rates of return aren't going to be as good because you have so much cash tied up into that asset. Whereas if you can borrow the money for, you know, the, even on a commercial rate, 5%, uh, and you're going to borrow the rate of five percent, but your property is going to earn you ten percent. Right. You know now you're taking a portion, a large portion of that money above the down payment, and you're increasing its return. 
yep. and leveraging it like like very like like take a crowbar and you leverage up a sewer grate. You know, if you go try to pick that sewer grate up by your hand, unless you're if you're a big strong son of a bitch, you can probably do it. <laughs> but <laughs> that's a real word we use for it. Like, son of a bitch. <laughs> if you're a strong son of a bitch, you're gonna do it, but you're gonna grunt and strain, you're not gonna be as right. effective. Yeah. But if you take a crowbar and you stick it in there and you step on it and leverage yeah. it, yeah. well then that changed the ball game. And yeah. it's a lot easier to get that up there. And that's the same way with your money. You're leveraging your money to make it work easier and you can also do more. So uh, your market, right? The uh, Kentucky and the Cincinnati God's market. country. We call God's it God's country. country. <laughs> so talk about God's country and the kind of real estate that people can buy there. And then let's use an example of a cash purchase versus a leverage purchase. Just to go through a simple example. So we're, you know, we, a lot of German inspired architecture where we're at mm -hmm. because a lot, of, a lot of Catholic Germans settled the area. Um, a lot of small to mid-sized apartments. Since the Cincinnati proper is older inventory because that was built up first. Um, and I, like I said, I, I live on the Kentucky side, kind of very similar setup that you have here, mm -hmm. except we have a river instead of a street sign that separates that says, us. That says Nevada, <laughs> California. Right. Yeah. We don't have a street. I can't walk. Though. I can walk across the bridge. But uh, we like to do both sides of the market. Our housing stock and, and commercial stock is a little newer on the Kentucky side. Mm -hmm. And taxes are a little cheaper. There's just not as much yep. to pick from. Um, so you're, you know, you're looking at a lot of, I mean, if you're on the Cincinnati side, a lot of, a lot of product built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s which I'm not a fan of, you know, flat roofs, boilers, it's ugly, you know, <laughs> I like, I mean, I mean, it's ugly. And if it looks ugly when you buy it, it's going to be ugly to a renter. So you yep. got stuff you got to think about. Yeah. Um, on the other side, you know, you got, you know, I, I like that 70s, 80s stock is when I tend to get like a little more of the type mm -hmm. of product than 70s and 80s and 90s stuff. If you can get a little bit of something like that, it's better, better cared for. It's up to code. You know, but there's other kinds of, we could do a whole other podcast right. on that and the pitfalls you fall into buying that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the type of stock that's there. You know, we play with a lot of, you know, four units, 10 units, 20 units, because we're ve it's very dense. So I don't work because of, you know, the way the management company set up, I'm not worried about a straggler property because it's only going to be a couple miles away. And we really focus on the price per door and mm -hmm. that, that we're a total right. investment. So if I got a two family, you know, on Scott Street, for example, and I got a four family a block away on Green Up. So within a block, I got six units. Right. And I looked at it as collectively because my office is a half a mile away from that. Right. Okay. And so that's how we're able to effectively manage. I don't, I don't like to be scattered sites. So I like to keep everything in, in a certain little three mile radius. And you manage possible. it all as well. Yeah, we have a staff that manages. We have a company, we have a management company, and we're, yep. we're the boots on the ground and the brokers, the whole nine. Okay. So we try to cut out the layers of fat only to really dig in and know what the hell we're talking about because I've learned with like the telephone game if you have this person and this person and this person yeah the deal goes from this to this real quick and then everyone's not only puts their spin but they put their spin so they can take out their fee which doesn't work for this kind of stock for for us so uh what's the price so you said let's use the four unit so the four door so how much would somebody and how much I think they're the the for the people who live in large metropolitan areas, they're going to be shocked at the prices you're going to Well, we just put so. a four unit under, so we do mailers. Yep. You know, you ever, you ever get a mailer, you know, want to sell your rental <laughs> property? We do those. Um, we have MLS access and everything else. I just did a four unit. Just We just put it under contract. It was from a mailer. It was four studio apartments, uh -huh. right? And it was put us right in our core area where we're, where we're at. We got it under contract for $70,000. No way. Four doors. Four doors for seventy thousand. Now it's boiler heat, and it's an older building because it's in the city, but it's got the cool architecture features, and it had a detached garage which was leased out separately. The total gross income on this thing was like twenty four hundred a month, and there was still a little more meat in the bone to push. Um, took really good care of it. They got got it off a mailer. We got this deal off a mailer, right? So seventy grand. If you took it to a cash purchase, like we talked about, what would but like give the difference of the numbers, because just so everyone realizes, uh, like you said, the re return we, is very different when you have the cash versus the leverage. Let me get a little calculator the here, because I can leverage. walk through so the numbers with 70, you. So 70. And we sold it, and we're very transparent with our fees. So the buyer that we put into this, we charged him a $7,000 fee. Yep. So his buyer... His, 10%. He, he, we're, in, in each deal structure a little differently, depending yep. on what the deal flow is. But and it's very... It, we itemize it. You're buying it for this. You're paying us this. Your closing costs are this. Yep. Uh, I'll show you. I built out a deal analyzer that I show you. I built out a big four-page Excel awesome. deal analyzer with a with a loan calculator. 
It's got like little blue highlighted fields with directions, plug this, this, this. I can show, I'll send it to you. And you can just plug in this, 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 and you can do a comparison. I can analyze any deal, any size in about two minutes. If I have the okay, data. so let's do seventy thousand. Well, that's on my you laptop. The so, fee. I'm, I'm a, so, so he's in for seventy-seven thousand plus. He, he, this particular buyer is buying cash. Okay. He has an IRA. He's supposed to spend it. Yep. All right. So he's in for say seventy. His cash purchase price is like hundred, eight hundred bucks. So yep. he's in for seventy-eight thousand. Is what his total <laughs> is. His is all in by his. He has a little bit of. I would call cleanup work I'd like to do. I always budget something because there's always something that yep. the previous landlord never did. And we we plugged him in a budget of seven grand for that. Okay. So he's all in for let's just say eighty five grand. Okay. All right. This building's gross in twenty two fifty a month. That's okay. the gross. After expenses, because you know, a good rule of thumb is fifty percent okay. when you're paying utilities. After expenses, he's grossing eleven twenty five a month. When I times that out by twelve, it's thirteen five a year after expenses. Yep. Right? Divide that by his eighty-five thousand all-in investment, and he's unleveraged at fifteen point eight. Wow, that's good. Right now, if I had a loan calculator handy and you did put a loan on something yeah. like that, that fifteen would jump to twenty-nine, thirty percent easy because you'd be leveraging. Now, leveraging smaller properties like that is yep. not the easiest thing to do because the banks don't like them. Because the banks don't like them. I mean, if you're local and you live there and they know you, it's a different story. Yep. But then you're going to put three thousand dollars closing cost into a seventy thousand dollar deal, that does which make sense. I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. You know, uh, if your closing costs are more than three percent, you know, yep, it doesn't make sense to me. Yep. But so you talked about so we've talked about interest rates. We talked about cash versus leveraged. And again, those of you that are interested, if you go to askworld.com, put in your name, phone number, and email. And if you want an appointment or you want to know more. Uh, a lot of my guests were pulling into webinars because there'll, there'll be enough input out there. Because we've got we got over a hundred thousand people watching this whole thing out there. It's kind of fun. And our ask they can't see me, can they? Uh, they can't see us. Okay, no. that's good. Just our that's audio, good. just our voice. Um, but if you also want to know about the tour that we're going to be taking, like we're literally going to go into these properties. We're going to go into title companies. We're going to go into the banks. Like we're literally going to walk you through what Jesse does and how he does it. And you'll have an opportunity to buy some real estate if you want. Yep. End of July. So again, go to AskLaurel.com and in the comments section, say, I want to go on that tour and we'll have somebody follow up and get you signed up. The last piece I want to talk about, though, is the private money. Like, I love private so, so money. So a deal like this would be perfect for private money. Okay, so explain we, private money to those listening. Because a lot of you, like I did, I just did, I told Jesse, I've done three deals. and It's in a different part of Ohio, but I just did three deals and I was private money for someone else and it was a cash purchase. And it's kind of a combination of the conversation we're having, but describe that. So so your private lender is someone that may have cash. They could have cash in their own lazy asset. They, or they may be in a, in a, it may be in a self-directed IRA or, or the solo, uh, which For I'm learning is, is the same thing mm -hmm. as, as a self-directed, right? Um, and it's just doing nothing. So they may want to loan it out and they may want to, you know, if you, you can maybe borrow it from them at like 8%. Yeah. And secure it against the real estate. Even something a little higher rate like that on a property like I just gave you here, you would still probably bump your return up to 18 to 20 percent, depending on how much of the money you borrowed, and you wouldn't have to put maybe say 85 grand out of pocket. You know, and you could maybe pull back some of that cash and do two deals. So if someone is listening that have lazy assets, which we'd say anything under 10 percent is lazy. Um, again, you could let us know. Say, hey, I want to be private money. But Jesse and I are now partners, and we take your private money and find some good real estate. And what the private money gets is typically the first position. Correct. Correct. Yeah, just and like instead of instead of a big Wells Fargo, U.S. or National Bank or big bank as a lien holder, it'd be Joe Smith IRA yeah. or wherever they loaned it out of would be the first lien holder. Okay. And then on the other side, if they want to find private money, what would you advise people to do to go find private money? You you probably know a half a dozen dozen private lenders, and they don't even know they're private lenders. Yeah. You know they've got an IRA from a job they've left, and it's still sitting there, um, just doing nothing. Yep. You, you know, and it's just sitting there, and then you educate them on how to turn it over to a self-directed or to a solo 401k, to where they can then direct their asset and lend you the money. Yeah. You got to educate yourself on that piece. And then once you know enough about it to explain to someone else, then the next part is know who to have them talk to to get it converted. Right. Right. Do right. the handoff. Do yep. enough to get them to the handoff position, and then and know enough, and then you do your job and know what you can pay and have your deal sustained. Awesome. So again, if you have any uh, questions, comments, want to engage further in the conversation, go to askworld.com. Say I want to talk more to Jesse. I want to talk more about that Ohio and uh, Kentucky. What do you call it? <laughs> 
Kentucky. The, good old, the uh, God's country? I, I call it God's country, but oh, okay. it's the bluegrass state, but I call yeah. it God's Actually, country. Actually, I live on the Kentucky side of the river. Oh, you do? You're Kentuckian. Well, I grew up in Ohio. I live in Kentucky. Uh, yeah. how, why'd cheaper you make taxes. Them? Oh, God. A lot cheaper taxes. And then I married a girl from Kentucky at one time. Uh -huh. But then when I divorced a girl from Kentucky, <laughs> but I had to stay so in Kentucky. The kids, so the kids are still in Kentucky. The kids are still in Kentucky. There yeah, so, so, and I like it there. I, I consider that home now. Yeah, I look forward to seeing it uh, and coming back out. In July, we'll be visiting the 27, 28, 29. So mark your calendars. Let us know uh, if you want to engage in this whole conversation. There's a lot of people doing interesting tours, I call them, but not like boots on the ground and what we're going to be doing. So, Jesse, thanks for this conversation today. And all of you, you've been at uh, Laurel's Real Money Talks podcast and we'll be talking to you soon. Have a great day. Thank you for joining Laurel for this segment of Real Money Talks, how to make money, manage money, and invest money. To continue this new conversation and to find free resources to support your wealth creation, visit asklaurel.com forward slash podcast gifts. That's A-S-K-L-O-R-A-L dot com forward slash podcast gifts. Thanks for listening and join us again soon. New episodes are released every week.